We looked at the uh, 22nd chapter of Matthew last time, <clears throat> the first 14 verses, as we considered that parable that Jesus told about the, the king and the wedding feast for his son and the unthankful people that he invited and did not come and uh, his wrath upon them and then his blessing going to, of course, it was to be a symbol of him calling the Gentiles then to, to himself. And we're going to continue on with that chapter, uh, 22nd chapter. This morning, let's ask the Lord's blessing on the ministry of, of his word. Father, we do thank you for the gospel of Matthew. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the parables of uh, your son as we can meet and hear the Lord Jesus Christ right right here in these words and we pray father that his words would be powerful to us that by your spirit they would live and that you would give us uh, ears to hear eyes to see and hearts to love your word and and minds to understand and we we pray this all in Christ's name amen <clears throat> been just started to read a, a book on the Second World War that uh, I thought I'd read a couple of paragraphs to you from. It's by a fellow named Victor Davis Hansen, and uh, going to give us an example of, of something experienced in this life that would cause people to ask some questions of God. He begins the book this way. Some 60 million people died in World War II. I, can't, I was thinking about this last night. I can't in my mind conceive of one million of anything, right? I don't know if it's trying to, okay, I'm going to try to picture even one million. But here, 60 million people died in World War II. On average, 27,000 people perished on each day between the invasion of Poland September 1st, 1939, and the formal surrender of Japan, September 2nd, 1945. Bombed, shot, stabbed, blown apart, incinerated, gassed, starved, or infected. The Axis losers, and the Axis then would have been uh, Germany and, and her allies, the Axis losers killed or starved to death about 80% of all those who died during the war. The Allied victors largely killed Axis soldiers. The defeated Axis killed mostly civilians. More German and Russian soldiers were killed in tanks at Kursk, well over 2,000 tanks lost, than at any other battle of armor in history. The greatest loss of life of both civilians and soldiers on a single ship, 9,400 fatalities, occurred when a Soviet submarine sank the German troop transport Wilhelm Gustloff in the ba Baltic Sea, January 1945. The costliest land battle in history took place at Stalingrad. Leningrad was civilization's most, most lethal siege. The death machinery of the Holocaust made past mass murdering from Attila to Tamerlane to the Aztecs seem like child's play. The deadliest single day in military history occurred in World War II during the March 10, 1945 firebombing of Tokyo when 100,000 people, perhaps many more, lost their lives. The only atomic bombs ever dropped in war immediately killed more than 100,000 people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki together, most of them civilians, while tens of thousands more ultimately died and were maimed from radiation exposure. World War II exhausts our superlatives. Its carnage seemed to reinvent ideas of war altogether. And you read the, those kinds of history, and, and that's just reading about it. If you were in it, you would be led to question God, right? Why? Why, God? Why do you, why did you permit this? Why don't you stop this? And, and so it's this subject that we want to consider this morning, this matter of questioning 
questioning God. Uh, follow along as I read. I'm going to read the remainder of Matthew, starting at verse 15, um, where we find Christ's enemies, of course, the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, Herodians, and others, uh, arrogantly throwing questions at Jesus. And they were confident that they could outwit him and win the debate. It doesn't work, of course. The creature, the creature, you can imagine the creature is going to debate the, the creator. But listen to this account, and then we'll see uh, how this thing still happens today. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what, tell us then what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say there's no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his brother to his wife, his wife to his brother. So, to the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. You can probably see the smirks on their face, right? Well, we've got him now. But Jesus answered them, You're wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Present tense. Right? He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. All right. Well, I think that you can see now already that that certainly there's, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong inherently with asking God a question, right? Lots of godly people are recorded in Scripture asking God lots of questions. So, for example, Job, right? 
He had a lot of questions to ask of the Lord. Then call and I will answer or let me speak and you reply to me. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? As all those trials had come upon Job, he's calling out to God. These questions. The psalmist, David, Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught. Do something about it, right? Let them be caught in the schemes they've devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. And if I would have been alive, some of you were back in World War II, you, you would say, Lord, why are, you, why are you letting this happen? So sometimes, especially early on in the war, when it looked like the, the evil side was winning, and they were winning many battles, say, Lord, why? Why, why do you allow this? Why don't you put a, 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 stop, a stop to it? And afterwards, when the news began to come out about the concentration camps and the Holocaust and so forth, and you see the pictures of those things that, that you know, why, why do you allow that, Lord? And we still, we still see those atrocities uh, happening then today. But neither Job nor David nor any other godly person in the scriptures were rebuked by the Lord for asking these questions. And God doesn't rebuke us because, simply because we ask him a question. Of course, the, what's the issue? The issue is what issues from the heart. It's, it's a heart, mo the heart and the motive of the person. It's uh, why is the why being asked? What is your purpose in, ask, in asking the question? And we see that here in, in Matthew 22. These, these questions that they open up with flattery, as, as you saw, um, are not out of a true desire to know the truth. They were, these questions were motivated by an evil desire to attack the Lord, to destroy the Lord. They would, they would have killed him then if, if they could have, but his time had, hadn't come. And so here, in these questions in Matthew 22, we have, we have questions that are, that are asked from an evil motive and for an evil purpose, and that is always simple. It's identified right off the bat here in verse 15 as we began to read this section. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. So this was a very, very, this isn't a matter of people not knowing who he was. They'd already seen many of his miracles. They knew about the, the virgin birth. They knew all, all of these different things but they knowingly plot to destroy him and to trip him up, to entangle him by asking him these deep questions then, you see. Now, that's not only the motive of the enemies of Christ in the days that he was here upon earth, it's the, it's the motive of the enemies of the Lord in all eras, including uh, in our own. Think of, for example... Um, the attacks that we've seen down through the history of the church on, uh, on the scriptures, on, on the Bible. How many of the enemies of the Lord have written volumes and volumes with the intent to prove that this is just myth, it's fallacy, it is, it is in no way um, the inspired, inerrant word, word of God. It's been attacked. That was the whole liberalist a uh, higher critic motive in the early part of this century, right? Latter part of the, well, last century now. Latter part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s, that uh, people like J. Gresham Machen had to uh, fight against as the virgin birth was being denied. And, and, uh, and this was all happening in the theological world, in the theological seminaries. You see, the, the Bible was being attacked, the inerrancy and inspiration of God's word relentlessly. 
Uh, so you have, for example, here's, you could think of many kinds of attacks on the Bible as well. The Genesis account of creation is pure myth. Okay? The resurrection of Christ is a fable. The miracles of Christ never happened, and of course that includes his resurrection. There's no way that he, that he rose from the dead. Uh, they love to point out supposed contradictions in the Bible and supposed historical uh, uh, errors, the denial of the deity of Christ, and, and on and on. And you can go on your, go on uh, television, at, at home, online, just you were to search for programs, uh, maybe PBS or BBC or someone puts out on, on Christ, you know, something about maybe the quest of the historical Jesus or so forth, and they will always present to you a man. The bottom line is, you know, he, he was good, maybe remarkable, but nevertheless, he's just, he's just a man. He's not, he, he, is, he is not God. So these attacks against God's word come, and they are often couched, aren't they, in the form of questions. Questions. And they come disguised as a, a quest for, you know, we're in the, this is a quest for the historical Jesus. Yes, we really want to know the true, the true Jesus. Well, implied in that, of course, if we were to say, well, then why don't you read your Bible? Oh, well, we, yeah, we don't believe that. You know, we've got to go, we're going to have to go elsewhere. And, and so often then, in fact, I think you could say typically, these enemies throwing the questions that are really accusations, um, are, uh, are the, who are they? They're the intellectuals. They're the scholastics. They're the, the supposed brilliant scholars. Academia, uh, generally down through history, has been, has been opposed to Christ and uh, opposed to the, to, the tr to the truth of Christ. It's always been an enemy and increasingly so than in, in our day. Well, you see the same thing here in these attacks. In Matthew 22, who are these questioners? Well, they're the supposed leading minds of the day. These are the great, the great theologians, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the experts on the law, the Jewish elite. And Paul ran into them many times as well. He also ran into the intellectual elite of the Gentiles. You remember in Acts chapter 17 when he's at Athens. And he, uh, is, he is opposed by who? Who's he opposed by there? Who is it that's scoffing at him? The philosophers. These philosophers who, they hung around Athens just trying to come up with something, something new. By the way, that's what, uh, you understand, that's what, uh, that's the engine that drives academia. If you've ever been around academia, you'll, you, you will see it. It can, be, it can be a good thing if somebody's really looking for truth. But for the most part, what's happening in academia, and I would include not just secular academia, but theological, suppose Christian academia as well, is, um, is something new. All right? That's a, if you were going to go to a university and work on a, a PhD or a THD, a doctorate degree, well, what has to appear in your dissertation, you, you, have to, you have to propose, you have to develop something new. You have to contribute to the body of human knowledge. That's, that's what's driving it. And so that's why there's always this pressure on faculty and academia to publish. I've got to, you know, you've got to publish. You've got to come up with something new. Well, trying to come up with something new when it comes to the revealed truth that God has given us in scriptures is pretty dangerous, you see. That's, that's, what, drives, uh, that's what drives heretics. But this is, this is a method that the devil has loved from the beginning, questioning the truth of God. Genesis 3.1, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, you could say, he asked the woman, right? Did God 
actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see? Questioning God. He's questioning God. Questions are not inherently evil. That one was evil. It was asked by the evil one with an, with an evil motive. But questions in themselves are not inherently evil. In fact, anyone who grows up, for instance, in a local church, say you grow up in a local church, and, and you, you see that that atmosphere or the climate in the church is you don't ask questions, you don't question anything. You just listen and you don't ask questions. Well, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Because we're wrapped up in comparing what we're being taught with what the scriptures say. In, inherent in that is the asking of questions. Let's see, does that, does that measure up to what, to what is, is said in, in, in scripture, you see? So questions are not inherently evil. In fact, questions um, are the way that we learn. I think you could probably accurately say it is impossible to learn without asking questions. I don't see how, it, how it, the thing could be, could be possible. How can I know something? How can I come to know something if I don't ask a question about something? So you see it in science. How does gravity work? I, we're still not real clear on that. I, I watched an update on uh, Einstein, his theories and so forth, and when it was over, I, I'm still not sure I understand how gravity works, or anybody does, but, uh, <clears throat> but, or even, what is light? People are still asking that question. What is light? What is energy? How does blood transport things? How, do, how does that happen? It's a good thing somebody asked that question at some point and learned some things about that. Lots of us would be dead, all right, if, we, if, if uh, medical science didn't know those, those kinds of things. Why does a particular disease happen? We want to, we hope somebody's asking some questions about the coronavirus right now, right? Some after finding out and, and learning and, and studying how is it, where would it come from? How is it transmitted and what kind of a remedy, a vaccine can we, can we develop? Against. So without questions, there would be no knowledge, there'd be no science, and there'd be no theology. There would be no, no knowledge, no knowledge of God. He reveals himself to us, right? In, in the beginning, in general revelation, he reveals himself to us in the creation. We're accountable then to see the creation and, and what... I mean, what's the first thing that's going to happen to an honest person? You look at creation, you say, you ask a question. Where did all this come from? Where did this come from? And then your reasoning process go, goes, in, goes in, into play. When it comes to the Bible, it's proper to ask some questions. Where did this book come from? That's not, that's not a sinful question to ask. In fact, it's a question that we'd better ask and, and because there's good answers to that, to, that, to that question. How do we know the Bible was transmitted accurately? How many times have you heard people just off, you know, they'll just say it quickly. They never research it anything. They'll just say, oh, I don't pay any attention to the Bible, you know. That thing's been translated so many times, there's no way that it is what it originally was. It's a <coughs> statement of ignorance, but, um, but we have... Good answers to those things. How do we know that the Old Testament history is accurate, that's given to us in, in Scripture? The whole science of history and archaeology, you see. Um, what evidence do we have that the Gospels, the Gospel record of the birth and the life and the acts and the, and the death and resurrection of Christ are accurate? How do we know, how do we know the Gospels are accurate? Do the things I'm being taught in my church square up with what the Bible says? Where did God come from? How can it be that anything or anyone can never have a beginning? I don't, I don't, under, I don't understand that. And you have people and their questions 
Asked that we still need to be asked today. People ask Jesus, what must I do to be saved? That's a pretty good question, right? It's an, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent question. So knowledge is an impossibility without questioning. And questioning then can be proper even when there's no answer, even when we can't be given an answer. That's why we looked at, at Romans 9 that deals with you know, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated, and, uh, and here's somebody coming along in response to the doctrine of election and saying, well, hey, if it's all up to God's choice and not up to man to, to do and to run and so forth, well, then how can God hold me accountable? It's not, it's not my fault. And there's no explanation given. It's just, shut up. This is God. Who are you, oh man? To, to answer back to God. You are the clay, and, and, he, and, he is, and he is the potter, you see. So there's many questions that we can ask about God that, there, that at least in this present life, we're not going to, there is no answer that we can comprehend. We can't comprehend the doctrine of the Trinity. We can't comprehend fully the doctrine of the deity and humanity of Christ. We, you can't, uh, you can't even really, we can't fully grasp and understand how the Holy Spirit used the apostles, men, to write the scriptures without error and to write exactly what God wanted them to write and yet not violate their personality, you see. How, how, how does, how does that work? And we can't fully understand those things. But we can still ask questions about those things. And it is proper to do so. And so we can say, questions that are proper and are blessed by God are what? They're questions that proceed from an honest desire to know the truth. An honest desire to, to, know, to know the truth. Now, this requires a starting point. And I think that it's correct to say that <clears throat> there is a point at which all of us must stop asking and start confessing. All right? There's a point at which, and it's the beginning point of knowledge, that I have to stop asking questions and I have to simply believe. It's called faith. And that, that is exactly what the scripture says, that knowing God and his truth starts with faith. So, so listen to, this is what Hebrews 11 says, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Can see, I'm, I'm convicted of things not seen, like God. I'm convicted that He is there. I take it by faith. And even at the basis of our faith, He's revealed Himself to us. I look at creation, I say, I believe that God is there. There's a creator. Somebody did, someone did this. All right? That's where I start. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, right? That's by faith. You, you have to begin here with faith in, in matters like that. You're not going to be able to find somebody who says, oh yeah, I was there. I, this, is how he, this is how he pulled that one off. No, you, there's only one way that you're going to be able to take that, and that is by faith. I understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made was not made out of things that are visible. In other words, God created it all out of nothing. By faith, Abel offered to God more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. 
Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And here's the summary and the punchline here. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, okay? Whoever, whoever wants to know God. That's what he's saying here. You want to know God? You want to know and, and the things he's revealed to us? You must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Right? There's the beginning point. And as long as somebody still persists in, well, I just don't know. I don't think I can believe that. I'm going to have to have some more. You're going to be stuck right there. And you'll never, you will never know God. If you think about it, there comes a point where questioning God, questioning God is, becomes making a demand of Him. Well, God, I know, okay, if you're there, I insist that you provide more, more evidence to me. Whereas Romans 1 says, He's not only revealed Himself to you, the things that he's shown you are clearly seen. They're clearly seen. And, the, and if you're blind to them, it's because you are actively suppressing them because you don't like them. You don't like the fact that, that God exists. So faith is the starting point. Believing that he exists and that he is going to reward, that is answer those who, who, who seek him. Jesus was, I think, thinking of this when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you'll, you're never going to know God unless you come to me in faith because I am that truth. I'm the embodiment of that truth. And he says it plainly, John 7, real plainly here, verse 17. Here, and this is a promise. If anyone's will is to do God's will, all right? If, if anyone sincerely wants to do the will of God, to please God, even if that, that means coming to know him, to believe in him in the first place, Jesus said he will know whether the teaching, that is Jesus' teaching, is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So see, it's always unbelief is the problem. Somebody says, well, I just don't, I see that Jesus said these things, but I just don't, I can't see that that's, that's, you know, I'm not, I don't think I can believe that stuff. Well, you'll never know. But if someone says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. If anyone's will is to do God's will. You, you, you're coming with honest questions, honestly want to know God, and you want to know, know Christ. His promise is that he will show you. All right? He will show you. I think we spend and waste a lot of time dealing with doubters. Dealing with doubters. Right? They're always, they're always have another question. Always have another question. Well, look, here's the starting point. You've got to believe that God is. And you've got to believe that he hears those who call upon him. Do you, well, are you ready to start at that point? Sincerely and genuinely, are you ready to begin at that point? And, and most of the time, people will not be. You'll see that they're just being hypocritical then uh, uh, about it. Because they'd really rather that God not exist so that they don't have to be accountable then uh, to him. Proverbs 1 begins this way. Let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying the words of the wise and their riddles. And here it is. The fear of the Lord. That, I think that just means that's faith. Faith. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you want to know truth, you want to know the Lord, the beginning, the starting point, 
is faith in God, fearing the, fearing the Lord. Refuse to do that, and you'll be you'll remain at home. God will hand you over to 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 your sin. That's why we see so many people around us increasingly, and just their lives are a mess, an absolute mess. And why is it? Because they they have no fear of God, and they re, they refuse to acknowledge Him. And, and God, you know, God is always ironic in His judgments, isn't He? He'll, it's, his judgments are like this. You don't want me? Okay. Here you go. Outer darkness. You see. That's really what hell is. At least in large part. I don't understand it all. But hell is existence apart from God. Exist, it's, it's kind of like before God started the creation. There was just this blackness and chaos, right? And to be to be separate from God completely is to be in maybe there's flames of fire, may what whatever might be there, it isn't good. <laughs> and and but it is it is hell is that condition, that place where God is not. This is what you wanted, then here is here is what here is what you have. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees despise wisdom and instruction. Their, the purpose of their questions was not to be instructed by the Lord. They call him teacher, you know, this empty flattery. They, they weren't there to learn and to be instructed by the Lord. They were there to uh, destroy him. Now, their questions, look at the questions again. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? That was a hot, hot issue of the day. Apparently the Herodians, <coughs> loyal to Herod, you know, and he's, he's in uh, with the Romans, so they were pro-paying your taxes and, and, and so on. The Pharisees probably against it. So here's a question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? <coughs> Sadducees question. In the resurrection of the seven, whose wife will she be? And the third question from the lawyer, which is the greatest commandment? In the law. Now, notice, in and of themselves, there's nothing inherently evil in any of those questions, right? There's nothing inherently evil in any of those questions. What makes them evil is that they were asked from an evil and wicked and Christ hating motive. They were accusatory, they were intended to then to destroy. They were put to Jesus with the intent of causing him trouble and ultimately even raising a, a mob against him and preventing the people from coming to him. You know, the judgment on the, for instance, the academics who try their absolute hardest to uh, indoctrinate people and they write books and send them into the churches and so on to cause people to doubt the word of God. What kind of judgment are they going to face? It's not going to be good. It's going to be intense. Actually, it will be good because it's it's the justice of God, and His justice is His justice is is beautiful, and uh, and and it, and it is, is and it is right. Now, here's an interesting parallel from Mark's chapter, and this one I'm relating to that last accusatory question, trick question asked of Jesus in Matthew 22, which is the greatest commandment of the law. But interestingly, if you go over to Mark chapter 12, here's what you find there. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Same question. This guy's asking the same question. It's a different guy. Right? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart 
and with all the understanding and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Same exact question, but this man is commended for asking it, right? He's commended. The other man is condemned because why? One asked from an evil motive and one asked from an honest motive. And therefore, it was, a, it was proper and it was a good thing that he, that he asked this question then of Jesus. Now, we also notice from these encounters that when a person questions God out of an unbelieving heart, out of an unbelie uh, unbelieving evil motive, that person is going to be shown to be a fool. Every single time you think, of it, you know, well, I, I'm going to win this debate. Jesus. I'm going to debate the Son of God, right? I'll, 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 I'll show that. I'll, I'll show you. We see this in Acts 17 again. Here's Paul again, then in Athens. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Okay? And again, that, that is the driving engine of academia. Going to tell her here something new. Got to come up with something new. You know, it largely drives economics as, as well. But so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, "Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious." Now remember, this is this is the academia capital of the world, Athens, right? Ancient Athens. For as I passed along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. I think Paul, he's already starting, you know, he's going, oh, men of Athens, this is pretty interesting. Here we are in Athens, you've got this altar to the unknown God, right? What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world. Okay, now he starts right at the big. This is the basics. This is ABC theology. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. Guess what, guys? He doesn't live in temples made by you. Right? You should have figured that out. Look at, what, what does he say? You look out the window here. You look at all of creation. And you, you should know, you know there's a creator. Is it logical then that you're going to say, I will build a house for him? The whole universe is his house. He, he's, he's more expansive than that. How can you? But this is what they do. They have all these temples. He doesn't live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands. You know, most of these idol temples, the priesthood in them, they, they would bring food and set it before the, the idol. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. So he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we are human beings, and we are the offspring of God. Your own writer said that. We are the offspring of God, the seed of God. Why are you guys making likenesses of God out of gold and silver and stone? Oh, there he is. He must be like that, you see. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance, God overlooked. Right? You see what he's saying to these guys, academia? Guys, it's time to be done with the ignorance. That time is over. Now, 
He's overlooked it. But now he's commanding all people everywhere to repent. Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, they procrastinated. We'll hear you again on this. Well, they didn't get a chance. Paul went out of their midst. And a few then believed. So Paul shows them their, their ignorance. He, take, he walks them through it. It's irrefutable. We aren't told that he, um, you know, usually when people mock in response to something, they don't have a valid argument against it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be just, just mocking. But this was the brilliance of the academia then of, uh, of, of that day. There's nothing wrong with asking questions of God. But it must always proceed from a believing heart that, that uh, knows and believes that God's going to hear our question. He's going to provide us with an answer to the best of our ability that we can, that we can understand. He's not going to be upset. In fact, that God delights when we, want to, when we want to know him better. But anyone whose life is characterized by a continual questioning, continual questioning, continual questioning. No amount of answers are good enough. What's, what's their problem? Their problem's not up here, it's down here. They simply do not want God. And they refuse then, and un unbelief then, is at the heart then of their sin. Well, what we'll plan to do next time is to uh, make a few more, we need to make a few more observations about these, uh, these three questions. And, uh, and then, of course, Jesus' question that he put to them about David uh, calling his son Lord. How, 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 does that all, how does that all work out and, and why, that sh why that shut them down? But let's end with this challenge. If anyone listening this morning is balking at believing the Bible to be God's word, or if they're hesitating to believe that Christ is the Son of God, the only way of man being put right with God, then you must realize that your doubts will never be answered until you acknowledge by faith what God has revealed to you already. That he exists, that he is your creator, that you owe him your, your thanksgiving, that you owe him acknowledgement in, in your life. In other words, knowing truth, coming to clarity on God and the things that he's revealed to us in the gospel begins with confession of faith. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And he promises that he will do just that. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. We, you didn't have to. We, you could have just let us go, but, but you delight in, in calling out of darkness a, a people for yourself. And your goal is that you will dwell with us and we with you in the new heavens and the new earth. And so, Father, we thank you and we give you praise for this. We pray that we would always um, put our questions to you in a right manner and know that you, you hear them. And as we look into your word faithfully, you reveal answers to us uh, and give us more of your truth. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.